Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to our lecture today in the uh, Sealaski Heritage's Native American Month Heritage Month lecture series. Uh, my name is David Russell Jensen. I'm the development officer here at Sealaski Heritage. Uh, my clinic name is Shekha Gu. I'm Kay Kwe Di, I'm a child of the Kwashki Kwan and the grandchild of the Tupacadi. Today, I would be remiss to not mention that we're so, we are remembering the birthday of the late Senator Albert Kukesh, who served on the Sealaska board and on our Sealaska Heritage Board as our vice chair. We remember Albert today and always, and we'll always remember his legacy of service. Thank you for joining us virtually today. We're glad to offer this option to connect you with our programming wherever you may be joining us from. Sealaska Heritage strives to provide programming for you, including Celebration, Baby Raven Reads, uh, and other language, culture, art, and educational programs. Grant funding does not cover all of our operations, and individual donations are critical. We would like to uh, ask if you'd consider contributing at a level that's appropriate for you. If you'd like to uh, contribute online, you can go to sealaskaheritage.org slash donate. Our lecture today is titled Infectious Diseases, Settler Colonialism and Race on Sheik Kukwan and is presented by Adam Kirsch. Kirsch is a doctoral candidate and self-described white Jewish settler whose family formerly lived in Romania, Serbia, and Britain. He has studied and wrestled with anthropology and its troubled past since 2009, receiving bachelor's and master's degrees in cultural and medical anthropology from the University of Central Florida. Through his master's research, Kirsch explored how undocumented immigrants access legal and healthcare services in uh, Sicily while working alongside organizations providing aid. Kirsch began his PhD in cultural anthropology at the University of California, Davis in 2016. He spent a year as an uninvited guest on Shinga Ani from 2020 to 2021 for his dissertation research with funding from the Weiner Grund Foundation. Uh, his research focuses on the exploration between settler colonialism, infectious diseases, vaccines, and race, examining how Russian and U.S. colonial governments have used infectious diseases as justifications for exercising their power. His research demonstrates the effect of racism on public health and has powerful implications for the management of the COVID-19 pandemic today. Kirsch aims to do research that is both publicly and academically engaged while promoting tribal sovereignty. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Please type your questions in the chat. Thank you, and please welcome uh, Adam Kirsch. Thank you so much for that introduction, David. I really appreciate it. And um, a big thanks to see Alaska Heritage for inviting me to speak today, as well as to um, Rosita, Chuck, and Mason for being great people to be in conversation with during the course of my research. Um, so I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So today I'm going to discuss um, infectious Diseases, Settler Colonialism, and Race on Shikakwan. And so to do this, first I'm going to give a brief introduction of this presentation and myself. Um, I'll quickly go over the methods and theoretical framing, um, introducing some ideas around anthropo uh, ideas in anthropology, the social sciences, and the humanities that inform the way I approach my research. Um, then I'll be discussing a couple of episodes of infectious disease outbreaks during both Russian occupation and the American occupation uh, before concluding. So um, as David said, I am a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology, um, and I wanted to take a moment to explicitly address my position. Um, so I am a white settler working on this project um, and being a white person in the US, this means that I have materially benefited from the settler colonial efforts that I'm going to spend time critiquing today. And the goal of this presentation is to focus on understanding and denouncing government racism as it relates to infectious diseases and public health efforts more broadly. Uh, I see this project as one that is seeking accountability while trying to encourage a conversation that acknowledges the role of race and public health. So my research more broadly looks at race, settler colonialism, and infectious diseases on Shikakwan, specifically looking at basically how Russian and Euro-American racism affected the way that they responded to and thought about these colonially imported diseases. Um, I'm also looking at how these legacies of race emerge today, but this presentation today is uh, just focusing on the historical component of my research. And so this presentation is a broad preliminary overview of the historical component of my research. Um, 
looking at uh, how white colonial responses to infectious diseases were fundamentally about control over Tlingit bodies rather than about health. And I see this presentation as a part of my ongoing research. Um, by this, I mean, I'm looking forward to the conversation afterward in, uh, by engaging with the audience in questions. And I wanna to continue to learn how my work can be useful and helpful. And the presentation I'm giving today is what we call an anthropology of the state, um, which basically means taking anthropological tools and methods to critique and understand the way that the government functions. And a main organizing principle of the state was and is racial whiteness. Um, by this, I mean that Russian and American colonial governance have worked exclusively for the benefit of their uh, white citizens. And in order to do this, um, it involves discussing painful moments in history, including racism, colonial, uh, colonial violence, and briefly sexual violence. Um, I will give a warning before I discuss sexual violence, just so everyone in the audience is aware. And if you'd like, you can step away from the screen or the presentation for a while. So uh, I wanted to talk about the methods I'm using today. So the information from this presentation is from archival research that I've done at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, the Alaska State Archives, Sika National Historical Park, Sika Public Library, and other locations. And the records that I have collected and analyzed today include government policy statements, um, colonial correspondences, as well as personal correspondences, diaries, memoirs, um, looking at a handful of medical records, newspapers, oral histories and oral narratives, and also looking at letters from the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood. And these letters really provide an important context for understanding how this essential Alaska Native civil rights organization was conceptualizing and responding to these colonial efforts. And of course, uh, my work is incredibly indebted to Kehwene Nora Dauenhauer and her husband, Richard, Richard Dauenhauer, um, whose work informs much of my research and um, their approach in particular is one that I strive for. They have managed to collect an incredible amount of information while retaining a really high degree of intimacy and personal detail, uh, helping to really create a holistic picture of um, people's lives. I'd also like to say um, that this colonial violence that I'm about to describe and critique um, whoops, has been unsuccessful. So the efforts of Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, various language programs, um, the awesome work of ANTHC during the pandemic, as well as the work of civil rights leaders like Kachichla, Louise Brady, um, demonstrate that this resilience to colonialism is vibrant and ongoing. And I wanted to include this quote from Chayi Ish, um, Richard Peterson, the president of Slingit and Haida, before going into this presentation, just to have this as um, something we keep in the back of our heads. Uh, so he said, it's time we call this what it was, an act of genocide. This was an intentional effort to erase who we are as indigenous people, yet we are still here. Each survivor of the boarding school era is an act of resilience, and their babies and grandbabies are an act of resistance. So first, I'm going to explain why whiteness. Um, why is this presentation focusing on whiteness? Um, certainly, some folks in the audience, uh, it's probably immediately obvious to, but as I said earlier, whiteness has been the organizing principle of settler colonial governments. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what I, how I define whiteness, what I understand it to be. Um, and one first thing that's really important to note is that race is a social reality with biological effects, but race as we understand it is not biologically real. And what I mean by this is the racial categories that exist in the United States don't correspond to any biological reality. Um, these were simply a set of uh, social hierarchies that were established. Um, so what we say to undergrads usually is race is socially very, very real, but biologically um, not. And when people discuss race, frequently the conversation can get fixated on skin color. Um, but scholars studying race have understood that ideas about race also include um, concepts about speech, behavior, education, dress, and even abstract things like work ethic. So even these things that have uh, nothing to do with skin color 
become racialized through associations that are made within society and culture. And for this project, I'm exploring whiteness as a historical formation that is produced through control of rights and resources and as a category that marks whites as separate from non-whites. Um, similarly, the ideology of whiteness imagines whites as the default and um, racial others as a deviation from the supposed default. Um, so again, we're, we are critiquing these ideas. And one of the fundamental um, characteristics of whiteness is that it's, it's oriented toward a self-assumption of superiority. And by this, I mean, um, the notion of white supremacy did not start because anyone was telling white people that they were superior in any way. White people themselves simply decided this um, and then codified this into a law. And so whiteness is both individual and structural. It's individual in the sense that a single person can act in a way that upholds whiteness and upholds white supremacy, but it's also structural in the sense that these individual prejudices have um, marked the way that laws are enforced and designed in the United States. Within Native American studies, um, scholars have understood whiteness as a tool that creates an abstract racialized other and an inherent right to land resources and bodies. And so we're going to see some of these attitudes come out as I move through this presentation. Two other important concepts um, that I'm going to be using a lot in this presentation are the ideas of biopolitics and necropolitics. So biopolitics is a concept that um, white French philosopher Michel Foucault came up with. And biopolitics deal with the way that the state tries to exert control over the bodies of a population in the name of public health. So this is all about how um, the government is trying to change our behavior in the name of public health. But this also involves what the government decides to be the ideal body, what the government decides the norm is that everyone else should try to um, become. And so biopolitics frequently intersects um, with race, gender, and class. And so um, these ideas about race, gender, and class become interlinked with health. And um, Gwen Poole scholar Eileen Morden Robinson has argued that biopolitics provides context for, quote, how whiteness operates through the racialized application of disciplinary knowledge and regulatory mechanisms which function together to preclude recognition of indigenous sovereignty, unquote. So this basically means that whiteness operates through, for instance, um, disciplinary knowledge like medicine. Ideas about whiteness come to inform the way that medicine is understood and practiced, which then reinforce white supremacy and close off possibilities for indigenous sovereignty. And a really important critique has come um, for a, a really important critique of this concept of biopolitics has come from Cameroonian philosopher Achille Mbembe. Uh, he basically said that Foucault's conceptualization of biopolitics didn't accurately capture the type of violence that happens in colonial settings. And so Achille Mbembe sort of tweaks biopolitics and talks about sort of the opposite side of the coin of biopolitics, which he calls necropolitics. And this is the process of suspending a marginalized population's right while rendering that population's death as acceptable to the state, often while exposing them to racial terror. And so whiteness is both biopolitical and necropolitical. Um, whiteness is biopolitical in the sense that it is trying to change racial others' behaviors to match whites, often in the name of public health while um, rendering these populations as killable. And by killable, I mean um, that their deaths is acceptable to the state, that the state feels no need to intervene in those deaths. And of course, all the while, while whiteness is enacting these violent ideologies, it's extracting economic value from the lives of folks of color. So these infectious diseases have played a really profound role in um, Southeast Alaska and the state as a whole. And um, they are definitely found in several oral narratives that we have. And one of these oral narratives comes from Astachai, who recounted the effects of colonially imported diseases, um, saying that they swept like fire through Slingat villages. 
one of his narratives also deals with um, a mass exodus from Haida Gwaii, saying a, a large population of Tlingit folks were living on Haida Gwaii um, and then moved north after a large outbreak of smallpox. Astachai also detailed how at shadowy villages, the surviving members of the Anak clan washed themselves with sa'acht and bathed in cold water for strength during these trying times. And what I'm going to discuss now is how under Russian settler colonialism, these colonially imported diseases um, such as smallpox, typhus, diphtheria, and syphilis had a really profound effect. So the Russians who um, came to Shitka around 1799 were really aware of the effects of colonially imported diseases, um, primarily smallpox, influenza, and syphilis. And the Russians noted that the, there was a difference in the mortality rates among Russians and among Slinget folks. And we can really see the racism they have at work in analyzing their explanations. So why did the Russians think there, were, there was this disproportionate mor mortality? So um, one explanation comes from Russian Naval officer, um, Peter Alexandrovich Tikhmanev, who was in Shika during the 1850s. And he saw these diseases as a quote unquote natural result of a supposedly superior civilization coming into contact with quote unquote savage people. So we can already see that Tikhmanev is operating through a very racist framework while he's trying to understand the spread of these infectious diseases um, because he's off the bat assuming the supremacy of whiteness here, automatically assuming that um, whites are superior and because of this, um, the outbreak of infectious diseases is simply a, a natural thing that's occurring rather than the result of specific historical processes that brought and spread infectious diseases to Slinget Ani. And there were also a couple of Russian physicians who were in Shitka this, around this time who were offering their own explanations for why um, the diseases were affecting Slinget folks more than Russian folks. And the Russian physicians assumed that this was due to heredity and biology, um, assuming white and Russian biology to be superior. And this is to the extent that um, the Russian physicians wrote that if a person of mixed race was born, they assumed this person would not be as affected by the diseases, um, but they found this to not be the case. Also in line with um, the dominant medical theory at the time, this was the dominant medical theory before germ theory became um, the norm. These Russian physicians argued that climate and seasonal changes were what caused the disease. So rather than considering that they themselves had brought the disease, uh, the diseases and were spreading them, they said that when the wind blows from a particular direction, that is what brings um, a particular infectious disease outbreak. But the main thing that they really focused on was um, sort of these elements of Slinget culture. The Russians argued that clothing, housing, and behavior were to blame. So they would say that um, Slinget people were not dressed appropriately, which of course is a ridiculous thing to say, um, as Slinget people had been living there for thousands of years, certainly know how to dress themselves on Shipa Kwan. Um, the Russians also talked about housing, and the Russians argued that Slinget housing um, was untidy, and this is what spread disease. But we noticed that in other places, the Russians say that Russian housing conditions are basically the same. Additionally, they blame the spread of infectious diseases on a couple of aspects of behavior. Again, they're, they're basically reaching for every possible conclusion other than considering the fact that they themselves, the Russians had brought and spread these colonial diseases. And so I have two quotes here that um, highlight these attitudes from the Russians. So Peter Alexandrovich Tikhmanev claimed that um, diseases were due to the lifestyle and the habits of the Unangach and Slinget, which greatly aided the transmission of the disease from one victim to another. Stuffy and often remarkably untidy dwellings, filthy clothing and intemperance and diet persisted despite the colonial administration's admonitions and efforts. And so, right, we can almost feel the prejudice pouring off the page with this quote in particular, um, that again, rather than considering the role of the Russians and bringing and spreading these diseases, they are immediately going to blame um, Alaskan natives. 
And what's particularly interesting here is the, the last bit of the sentence where they say persisted despite the colonial administration's admonitions and efforts. And this statement essentially implies that if only Tlingit folks would submit to sort of Russian biopolitical regimes of control, if only they would do this, then these diseases would not be spreading. And we have oops, a similar quote um, from two Russian physicians, um, doctors Romanovsky and Frankenhauser, who wrote the diseases particular to the Tlingit are indurated from their way of life, staying almost constantly in the open air, um, almost naked of head and body or badly clothed, especially in winter from the succession of daily sea baths. And again, the Russians here are pretty much doing everything other than looking at themselves to see how they themselves were, had brought and were spreading these diseases and are going to, again, blame these various elements of Flingit culture rather than themselves. And I placed italics on the end of the second quote, um, this, this fixation on the frequent daily sea baths, which to me is... So on the one hand, right, they're saying that the houses are untidy, the clothing is not clean, um, all of these sort of racist assumptions the Russians are making. But then they say that these, these actually practices of daily hygiene are what's spreading the diseases through this uh, fixation on the frequent daily sea baths. And so just looking at these quotes and trying to sort of um, understand the logic of Russian racism, we really quickly see um, their racial prejudices they bear. So as I said a couple of minutes ago, race is not only about skin color, but includes various aspects of culture and behavior that then become racialized or become associated with particular racial identities. And within whiteness and within um, colonial conquest, we've seen that um, whites and colonial authorities frequently become really fixated on cleanliness. Um, and they often portray racial others as unclean to justify colonial intervention. For instance, um, the British Empire, while expanding into Africa, became really fixated on bringing soap. Um, basically, the British were saying that the horrific violence that they were wreaking um, in the name of colonialism was justified because they were bringing soap, because they were bringing cleanliness. Um, And within these Russian comments, again, I mentioned that Russians um, described both Flingit homes and Russian homes as being in the same condition, but the supposed dirtiness that the Russians think they're seeing is only a problem to the Russians when it's associated with Flingit people. Um, they only see this dirtiness as spreading disease when it is not associated with whites. And so we can read this fixation on cleanliness as really an extension of their racial prejudice, particularly because, again, when we sort of look at the entirety of their comments, we find that they're just logically inconsistent. And so colonial Russians tendency to blame Slingit culture for the spread of colonialism, um, for the, sorry, the spread of colonially imported diseases and the inconsistencies in their reason, reasoning demonstrate that the Russians were engaging in a biopolitical and necropolitical project, rendering a racial other as inherently disease, making their death acceptable to the colonial government. And so I'm going to now talk about um, something that I did not initially expect to see in colonial records, but um, I saw the Russians fixate a lot on syphilis. Um, and in discussing this, I'm going to briefly discuss sexual violence and forced medical treatments. Um, so if you'd like to step away from a bit uh, from the presentation or turn it off or anything like that, please do so now. And I'm only going to discuss sexual violence as it pertains to the spread of syphilis. Um, and this is oftentimes a very difficult topic to talk about, partially because um, we are taught that this is a shameful topic to discuss. But what we have found is that this type of violence is a weapon of attempted genocide. Um, and so what I'm aiming to do here is discuss the gendered aspects of colonial violence to show how these ideas about um, whiteness intersected with ideas about gender and sexuality. So I will give everyone just a couple of seconds to either step away, um, turn the sound off, whatever you need to do if you don't want to hear on um, the next slide. Okay. 
So um, renowned Slingit historian and anthropologist, A.P. Johnston, recalled that during the Russian occupation, Slingit women would go to enjoy the forest simply to go out and enjoy nature. And Russian American company workers would be lurking in the forest and sexually assault Slingit women who came through the forest. The Russian telling of these events was quite different. Um, Russian physicians wrote that syphilis spread through, quote, relations with native women, and that Slingit women abandoned themselves in the forest to harlotry with the European employees in Novorok Ingelsk, Sitka, and thus infect many of them with syphilis. And so the Russians start to become very concerned with this outbreak of syphilis, but rather than seeing Russian American company workers as the problem or seeing how Russian American company workers themselves had brought and spread syphilis, they immediately go to blame Slingit folks. And so Russian officials were trying to figure out how to respond to this outbreak of syphilis that they themselves had brought. And their solution to this was to kidnap Slingit women from the forest, um, then to forcibly check them for any signs of syphilis, then to imprison them in hospitals and uh, undergo forced medical interventions, um, treating syphilis with mercury. If Slingit women tried to escape, the Russians would capture them and shave half of their heads, seeing this as a sign of shame in Slingit culture. And there's a really horrifying disparity between how the Russians responded to um, Slingit women and how Russians responded to their own workers. Um, there's these horrific forced medical interventions but when the Russian American company is trying to discipline its own workers, the only thing it really did was dock Russian American company workers pay. Um, and they ended up finding that the workers didn't care that their pay was docked and they would continue to go um, sexually assault fling at women in the forest. And we can see how this relates into a larger biopolitical project. Um, from this quote from these Russian physicians, Romanovsky and Frankenhauser, they wrote, if the Slingit have recently become more tractable and permit their women to be taken from the forest for treatment, this is only because with all their conceit, they firmly believe in the superiority of our powers and means over theirs. So <clears throat> the Russians saw um, any compliance with these horrific forced medical interventions as a sign that Slingit people allegedly recognized Russian superiority. And so we very quickly see that this project in itself, these forced medical interventions, are similarly about this means of exercising biopolitical control. And within scholarship looking at colonialism, um, whiteness, uh, within whiteness and within Russian colonial empires, Racial others have often been depicted as overly sexualized to justify colonial fantasies about desire. And similarly, biopolitical projects have often involved asserting control over sexual behavior. Um, as I said, this type of violence is a common weapon of war and a weapon of genocide, um, to the point that Muskogee scholar uh, Sarah Deer has argued um, quite well that sexual violence is a fundamental result of colonialism. And so what we see with this example is that Russian physicians described Slingit women as promiscuous, morally lacking disease vectors to justify a biopolitical project that incorporated sexual abuse, denial, and violence. The Russians imagined themselves as morally superior interventionists that were seeking to gain control over an unruly and promiscuous racial other, allegedly, right? And so now we're going to start transitioning toward um, the American occupation after the Alaska Purchase in 1867. But there are really some similarities between the ways that the Euro-Americans and the Russians approached, thought about, and responded to infectious disease outbreaks. So both the Euro-Americans and the Russians wrote about Slinget as racial others. And both of them justified violent biopolitical projects that were aimed at changing Slinget culture in the name of health and then blamed Slingit culture for the spread and presence of the diseases that they themselves, the European, or sorry, the Euro-Americans and the Russians had brought to Shika um, for these diseases. 
And one of the main differences between sort of the Russian approach and the Euro-American approach is that the Russians were ultimately dependent on slingot trade for survival, which um, arguably limited the extent to which they could exert control. But Euro-American colonialism seemingly went further than Russian colonialism by seeking to violently change almost every aspect of slingot life and culture. And there's also a really peculiar historical moment that's going on. Um, Euro-Americans like Sheldon Jackson justified these forced interventions, justified um, the creation of, for instance, the horrific boarding school program. Um, he said this was basically a way of avoiding the devastation of the American Indian Wars. Um, he saw himself as a kind of humanitarian in this way, which obviously was not the case. And as opposed to the Russians, the Euro-Americans ultimate goal was seemingly cultural and or total erasure, and they seemingly saw even less reason to intervene during disease outbreaks. So as I said, like the Russians, Euro-American colonizers blamed Slingit culture for the presence and spread of these colonially imported diseases. And like the Russians, they used assumptions about race to help justify efforts to change Slingit behavior. And so these efforts that were done in the name of quote unquote public health were in fact a part of exerting racialized biopolitical control. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the main parts of necropolitics is um, making the death of a particular group of people acceptable to the state. And we see this play out with um, Euro -American, white Euro-Americans' assumptions about Slingit people. Um, basically, they discuss Slingit people similarly to how the Russians did, and thus um, discuss their deaths in such a way that they did not feel the need to intervene in loss of life. And we can see this attitude actually play out a little bit on this old colonial map um, from 1867 that we have on the right here. So this is um, this map is the map of downtown Shitka that was drawn around the time of the Alaska Purchase, and you know you can sort of see the downtown part of Shitka here. You can see the wharf that is now um, the bridge between the two islands. But what's no most notable is this blank space in the northern part of the map. Um, this is where um, the Slingit community of Shika was living. And you'll notice that these um, colonizers did not even seem to think that it was worth mapping where the Slingit homes were. So we can even see this colonial erasure present in just the way that they were drawing maps. And we can also find um, a little bit of insight into how folks were thinking about the spread of these infectious diseases. So um, a local newspaper, the Sitka Alaskan in 1892 wrote that, quote, flu deaths of native residents outnumbered those of whites, unquote. And that, quote, as far as the white population are concerned, the malady is not malignant, but is stricken terror into the heart of natives, unquote. And I'm showing this quote to look at the juxtaposition we see where um, the newspaper said, as far as the white population is concerned, they're not worried about the disease. They seemingly are not worried about a disease that is affecting their neighbors. They are seemingly, according to this article, only worried about themselves. And so we can see how already the sort of um, violence that was inflicted from colonization is normalized in this quote. Um, white folks are seemingly unconcerned with this. And around this time, we see these ideas about infectious diseases actually start to play a major part, um, both in justifying the boarding school program and in efforts to move sheet Kesslingit folks into quote unquote Victorian style homes. So when Sheldon Jackson and others are writing about why the boarding school program needs to start, excuse me, they write that, uh, um, they needed to teach supposedly personal hygiene and village sanitation, right? And I've, I've already discussed a little bit uh, about this racialized fixation on cleanliness, um, but essentially part of the justification for the boarding school program was to allegedly prevent outbreaks of these infectious diseases. And similarly um, in Shika, there is the project of the Sheldon Jackson cottages. Um, here's a older picture of the Sheldon Jackson cottages on the right on Kelly Street in Shika. And the main, one of the main justifications for moving Slingit people out of their traditional family homes and into this Victorian style housing 
was ideas about infectious disease. And I have a quote that highlights the sentiment among uh, the Presbyterians. And so this is a quote from a Presbyterian Reverend A.J. Whipke, who was working in Huna in the 1910s. Um, and I'm including this quote because a Presbyterian missionary named Eva Wade, who wrote about Sitka and was working in Sitka, included this quote in her book. So clearly this idea from Huna is informing how folks in Sitka are um, thinking about and responding to infectious diseases. So um, the Presbyterian Reverend A.J. Whipke wrote, there is great need for more family or individual homes. At present, the communal house is the rule with these people. From two to eight families live in the communal house. This is bad for the people physically, mentally, morally, and spiritually. The house is practically impossible to keep in good order, and it will be impossible to eradicate tubercular disease so long as large households are maintained. There would be no use in trying to control an epidemic here. And again, we can see the racial prejudice basically jumping off of the page here. In particular, this last statement is incredibly chilling. Basically, this reverend is saying, there is no purpose in even trying to control an infectious disease outbreak if we can't get them to live like whites. Basically, if they won't submit to these biopolitical regimes of control, there is no point in trying to intervene. And we similarly see these attitudes, these, this racial prejudice um, emerge during various quarantines. So the first quarantine I'm going to discuss was um, in 1879. So after the Alaska Purchase, the US Army was briefly in control of Alaska, then the US Navy before there was a formal government established in Alaska, um, formal colonial government. And US Navy Captain Beardsley was in charge of Sheikha. He was the commander of the Department of Alaska for a year. And um, he imposed a quarantine during a typhus outbreak. But what's very interesting about this quarantine is that Beardsley only required the white inhabitants of Sheikha to quarantine. And then he forced Tlingit people to continue working to fulfill the work that white people were not doing because they were quarantining. And so in this, we already very, very plainly see which lives Beardley seems to think are important, which lives Beardley seems to think are worth saving. And we see this kind of racial prejudice as well as these sort of racially segregated quarantines pop up again and again. Um, the next of which was in 1901, where Governor Brady enacted a smallpox quarantine. This quarantine was exclusively for Tlingit people, and Brady sent Tlingit people to um, Yakwakashanehi, Japonski Island, to quarantine while they had smallpox, uh, sent them there for six months. And the records we have about this come from um, the letters from two Tlingit men, Jim Kichikowak and Archie Skamahadish, who were writing to Governor Brady, basically writing about the horrific conditions of the quarantine. They wrote that on the island, there was um, not enough food for anyone. There was no access to water. They had to bring clean, clean drinking water in um, with a canoe. And there was no good firewood. There was no shelter. And several people died of exposure while quarantining. And if um, the Slingit people quarantining on the island wanted to leave to go get food, there was a very strict police enforcement of the quarantine. The police did not allow anyone to leave the island or come to the island under any circumstances. And so these two men wrote to Brady, um, basically explaining the situation, asking him to intervene. And through how cruel this quarantine was, we see that Brady exposed Slingit people to death in the name of public health right? He's creating this quarantine supposedly for everyone's collective benefit, but he's doing so in such a way that is exposing Slingit people to death. And so these quarantines, we can see, were really fundamentally about control over bodies and asserting white supremacy rather than actually about health. And we have um, the letter from Jim Kichikowak to John Brady written on May 5th, 1901, um, on the right here, I apologize for the white line that goes through the letter, but um, here's a, a copy of the letter he wrote to John Brady asking for Brady to intervene. 
We also see a lot of these racial prejudices emerge when um, territorial governors are discussing finances. So during the influenza pandemic, um, Governor Riggs is writing to the American Red Cross asking for extra money to help combat um, a potential flu pandemic. The flu pandemic has not yet broken out in um, Slinget Ani yet. And so he's asking the Red Cross for money. And he wrote to the Red Cross, quote, if influenza does break out, unless we can receive help from outside sources, I shall be obliged to let the natives die, unquote. And I've, I've added the emphasis here because Riggs is not saying, if I don't receive money, um, all folks in Alaska are going to die. He's saying specifically, if he doesn't get this money, Slinget people and Alaska natives will die. And so seemingly Brady sees the money that the government already has as only for the benefit of whites. And if he can get this extra money, then he can actually intervene um, or try to prevent the spread of this infectious disease outbreak. And within this letter to the Red Cross, Riggs also is talking about um, the orphans and the widows that are produced from this pandemic. And meanwhile, at the very end of this letter, he does something very interesting. He starts to talk about the supposed virtues of Alaska's white population. He starts to say, yes, I need money to um, combat this infectious disease outbreak. And by the way, we have really high military service. Uh, whites have really high military service in Alaska and whites donate a lot of money to the Red Cross, the most per capita of any US territory or state. And this last little twist at the end of the letter basically argues that the conditions facing Alaska natives from colonially imported infectious diseases in and of themselves are not deserving of intervention. Only when there is a supposedly virtuous white population is, um, is this intervention worthwhile, is effectively what Riggs argues. And the reason I brought up this aid for pandemic widows and orphans in Riggs's letter is because we have a letter from Roy Paradovich, um, major Slingit civil rights advocate in 1941, who was writing that the state was excluding Alaska natives from economic relief for widows and orphans. So this exact population that Riggs mentions to the Red Cross saying we really need money to help out this population is seemingly not getting the economic relief that the state of Alaska is supposed to be providing. And we see something fairly similar during the tuberculosis epidemic um, that breaks out in the 1940s. So during the tuberculosis epidemic, um, there is a point when then Governor Gruning is writing to the Federal Security Administration asking for money to combat infectious disease outbreaks. And Governor Gruning in his letter, like Riggs, is emphasizing the disproportionate effects on Alaska natives that tuberculosis is happening. And similarly to Riggs, he does um, a very, he, there's a very perverse twist at the end of his letter. Um, Gruning basically says the Federal Security Administration should give Alaska money because if they do not give Alaska money to combat the tuberculosis epidemic, then whites will begin to get sick and therefore affect Alaska's quote unquote strategic importance. So we see that both of these governors are effectively arguing that intervention in infectious disease outbreaks is only warranted when that intervention benefits the settler colonial state. And I would be um, a poor researcher if I did not mention, of course, the incredible resilience that was exhibited in the face of these infectious diseases. So um, from oral narratives from Shakakuni, Judson Brown, um, he remembered that the flu pandemic was a very difficult time for many Slinget people. Um, but he said that he saw light and was given a sense of optimism from the energy of young Slinget people and in the activities of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood. Despite the pain of um, the flu pandemic, he saw resilience in these activities. And similarly, um, the Alaska Native Brotherhood pushed back on a few of these racially motivated quarantines that I discussed. Um, in particular, in 1919, 
There was a racially motivated smallpox quarantine in Cake in Petersburg, where only um, Tlingit residents or Alaska Native residents were quarantined and whites were not quarantined. Um, the Alaska Native Brotherhood wrote to the government trying to seek justification for this and trying to right the situation. And of course, in the midst of um, the tuberculosis epidemic in the um, midst of World War II, Elizabeth Paradovich um, and her husband Roy Paradovich worked to end legal housing segregation in Alaska. And so this presentation has also already talked a little bit about the way that housing is connected to these issues of biopolitical control and infectious disease outbreaks. And so we can see this um, effort to end legal housing segregation as in some way being a pushback against these colonial efforts. Um, and so we have a picture of Elizabeth Paradovich here. Elizabeth Paradovich is on the left part of this photo. Her husband, Roy Paradovich, is on the right. And Governor Groening, whose letters we were discussing a moment ago, is sitting there on the desk um, looking pleased with himself or something. And we've seen an incredible amount of resilience during the pandemic today. Um, in 2021, Alaska Native Regional Health Consortiums helped Alaska to become one of the most vaccinated states in the country early in the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also saw that these regional health consortiums um, also were giving vaccines to their white neighbors because they understand that health is a communal effort and is not restricted to a particular population. Um, and so these Alaska Native Regional, Alaska Native Regional Health Consortiums were giving the vaccines to their white neighbors as well, which is actually how I received um, my Pfizer vaccine from uh, Search. Also during the pandemic, um, tribal governments like Sika Tribe of Alaska have provided robust and immediate aid to tribal citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this resilience today is obviously ongoing in the face of the current pandemic. And so in conclusion, rather than being about preserving health, Euro-American and Russian um, quote unquote public health efforts, including quarantines, housing projects, and medical interventions were actually racialized biopolitical and necropolitical projects aimed at changing and or erasing Tlingit culture and people. And this presentation has demonstrated um, that whiteness strongly affected and determined the way that settler colonial governments have responded to outbreaks of colonially imported diseases. Um, not in this presentation, but in my dissertation, I also look at how this whiteness emerges today um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, throughout all of this, Tlingit and other Alaska Native people have maintained their resilience and strength despite colonially imported diseases and systemic racism. And so um, thank you all very much for listening to my presentation. I'd like to specifically thank Sika Tribe of Alaska's Tribal Council and Sea Alaska Heritage Institute for approving my project. Um, I'd like to thank Sea Alaska Heritage Institute for inviting me to present as well as for their excellent, excellent scholarship. And again, the wonderful conversations I've had with the scholars at Sea Alaska Heritage. Um, I'd also like to thank the Winter Grand Foundation for funding my dissertation research. Of course, a big warm thank you to everyone who participated in my research directly and indirectly, and a big thank you to the audience for listening today. And um, I would also like to send congratulations to Kahani Razita Whirl for winning the Howard Rock Alaska Native Leader Award recently. Um, so thank you all very much for your time, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Here's a list of my references. Um, since this is on YouTube, if you're curious about my references, you can come back and check these references out on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam. That was an incredible uh, and very well-researched presentation. Uh, really appreciate your efforts to document this important uh, subject. I see there is one question here in the chat, so I will read that. Um, okay. Uh, I can't tell who this is from, but uh, there are, the EA is asking, what differences or similarities have you seen in federal and state treatment of Clinket people in the earlier outbreaks of infectious diseases and the current pandemic? Hmm. One of the main differences really is that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the government has been much more concerned with tribal sovereignty. Um, obviously during these earlier outbreaks of infectious diseases, the colonial government 
didn't really care about tribal sovereignty, didn't really care about any efforts to self-govern. But in responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, as I mentioned, um, the responses in Alaska were largely successful because um, Alaska Native Regional Health Consortiums were exercising their sovereignty and deciding how to distribute vaccines in different places. Um, so I would I would really say that, that that's one of the, the first differences that sticks out to me. Thank you. There's another question that's came in from Tasia Loom. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Tasia writes, hello, in what ways have you seen and heard directly from Tlingit people the lasting effects of settler colonialism in the present day in specific, specifically uh, in relation to COVID-19? So one of the first things um, that I noticed during my field work, so um, in addition to this archival research, um, I have been living in Sheetka and have been um, interviewing people to hear about their experiences. And um, one of the first things I noticed is that when I was discussing infectious diseases, asking people about infectious diseases, the sort of lived experience and living memory is very, very different. Um, when I was speaking with Flinget folks, they would mention this history of colonialism, this um, history of infectious diseases as being this tool of colonialism, and would sort of contextualize the COVID pandemic within this longer history. Um, whereas the majority of the white folks I spoke with were, did not talk through history. They didn't uh, contextualize the COVID-19 pandemic within history in any way, shape, or form. They were just talking about the present moment. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I'm waiting for more questions in the chat, but I was just curious. I mean, it sounded like, I mean, you, you've conducted quite a bit of um, literature research, um, you know, scanning through maybe archives and, uh, and uh, published literature. But I was curious um, if you also, I mean, you assume you also benefited from, you know, uh, oral interviews, you know, and speaking directly with uh, direct sources. And I was wondering if you could speak on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, One of the decisions that I made during my research, so, so I've, I've been trying to be really conscious of my own position um, and particularly aware of the history of anthropology while I'm doing this research. And I was hesitant to basically ask um, elders or ask folks to relive these memories of historical trauma just for the sake of academic inquiry. Um, and so what I did instead was try to rely on already existing published work to rely upon the archives at Sea Alaska Heritage um, and other places that include the that include oral narratives, um, rather than asking people to relive this pain in any way, shape or form. And so um, really the the Downhower's work in particular just has these wonderful biographies um, that not only tell the trajectory of a person's life, but again, have this like very human element to it where they even include things like a person's hobbies, what kind of jokes they laughed at and create this really holistic picture of um, the people that they were working with. And so I've relied a lot upon that archival material um, to sort of find primary sources for these oral narratives without again, asking people to relive this pain. Thanks, thank you. Um, here's a question from Katie Olson. Have you defended your dissertation? Do you have current peer-reviewed published work that you might be able to share? Um, I have not yet defended my dissertation, um, and I do not have peer-reviewed published work on this research specifically. Um, so I've, I've just recently finished my data collection. As I said, this is sort of like a preliminary overview of what I've found so far. Um, and I'm, you know, anticipating uh, defending my dissertation in 2023, and I'm um, definitely planning to get uh, to publish some work on this. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from Lisa Wuerl. Uh, have you heard or noticed whether the Alaska Native Health Consortium's uh, consortium partnerships with state and local government has led to willingness to partner on other projects, for example, education? That's not something that I have specifically or explicitly heard about, but I think just sort of reading the way that um, government officials in Alaska are starting to talk now, I think that 
the pandemic has really shown the strength of tribal sovereignty and the strength of including, like actually having genuine government to government relationships. Um, so, you know, if any Alaska or if any uh, Alaska policymakers are listening, this is really the time to like seize the moment and to try and really get into these genuine government to government relationships because this response to the pandemic has been so incredibly successful. Thank you for that question. There are quite a few more coming in here. Uh, here's from Tom uh, Lido. Thank you for your presentation. How does your research inform what type of data should be collected today from a point of view of sustaining tribal culture and population? Mm. So I guess I would say as far as what type of data to be collected today, um, the, the first, and, first and foremost thing is for researchers like myself to work in partnership with tribal governments, to work in partnership with organizations, to try and see what information might be useful. Um, so rather than researchers sort of deciding what the problem should be, an ideal mode of research is like this cooperative idea where researchers are informed by the community how their work can be helpful. Um, so as far as the type of data that should be collected, I guess I would say that it, it would depend on the individual community, it would depend on the individual government and the sort of data that they're looking for. Um, but I think one of the most important things is for uh, researchers to be aware of their own position and to constantly wrestle with that as they're doing their research. Another question from Lisa. What has, the, what has been the response of your academic advisor and colleagues in your dissertation? Any pushback or are people surprised or critical as they hear details? Mm -hmm. So far, I've, I've gotten very supportive um, feedback. So far, my, my advisors have been um, excited about the project, excited about um, the way that I'm going about my research and have really, really responded well for the most part. Um, so, so thankfully, so far, everything, everything has been great, very smooth sailing. That's good to hear. Uh, have you looked at uh, access to the economy after 1867? Have you looked at, sorry, I'm trying to interpret this question. Have you looked at access to the economy after 1867 and how that may have interacted with Russian and American perceptions of disease being the fault of native people? I hope I'm interpreting that correctly. That's something that definitely came up in my archival material and something that I plan on thinking about more and will definitely get incorporated into my dissertation. But at this point, um, my thoughts on that aren't quite ready to live on the internet. <laughs> I understand that completely. Just see a general comment here. Um, just wanted to say Gwyneth Chish for the time and space to have these conversations. Hope to see more of these in the future. Um, let's see if there are any more questions coming in the chat. There, we had quite a steady stream here. People are very engaged. So. I think we can squeeze one more in if anybody wants to. Curiously type away at their keyboard. So far, I'm not seeing any more questions. One last chance. Well, thank you for your presentation. If you would like to uh, give us one closing remark here, uh, we'd be happy to uh, let you do that. I, I just want to say a, a big aslengunashish to see Alaska Heritage for, um, again, for inviting me here. Every single person I've spoke with that works at Sea Alaska Heritage is incredibly friendly, incredibly helpful. It's an awesome organization to work with. Um, thank you so much for your time. And I hope this presentation has shown people why it's so important for us to think about race and public health. I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. There was one question that just came in, if you would like to. Yeah, for us. sure. Um, big topic: epidemics to toxic, toxic stress to health impact today. It's kind of a um, interesting thread there. If you have any comments about that, mm -hmm. maybe the comparisons between the um, three comparison between like previous I, and today. I believe that's the question: um, mm -hmm. epidemics, toxic stress, and health impacts. If you have any insights. I, I mean, 
one thing that, that one, so this is, I'm a cultural anthropologist. This isn't my, um, this isn't my field in any way, but one area that has been really interesting um, talking about the effects of stress and racism on health is the field of epigenetics, which is uh, basically like a subdiscipline of biology that looks at how um, during our life, our DNA isn't always expressing itself in the same way that like a stressful event or a series of stressful event can actually change the way that your DNA replicates. Um, so these things like chronic stress and racism can have um, long lasting effects on a person. And so when I said at the beginning of the presentation, like um, race is a social reality with biological effects, this is, this is what I meant is that um, racism does have a profound impact on individual health. And of course, when we look at the effects of things like infectious diseases, we're almost never just looking at the individual, right? We're looking at sort of a whole ecosystem of things that come to determine how um, vulnerable a person is during an outbreak of infectious diseases. And I guess, I guess one of the things that I was thinking of just now is I remember that um, while I was doing my research Bob Sam was at a storytelling event, did a phenomenal job as always. And one of the things that he said was, um, this is the time in his life when he's felt the most optimistic um, about life for Slinget folks, that he sees things as improving and moving in a good direction. Um, and so hopefully, as you know, ideally, the Alaska government starts to engage in more government to government relations with um, tribal governments, with um, Alaska Native corporations will start to see, you know, some of these health effects dissipate. Um, yeah, I hope I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Well, we're just here over the one o'clock hour here in Alaska. Um, Want to respect people's time um, and really appreciate the thorough research that you've presented to us and uh, your expertise that you've shared. It's been a very enlightening pre uh, presentation. And I also want to share that our next lecture will be our final lecture in our November lecture series. It's, it will be presented Tuesday, November 30th, and that will again only be available on our YouTube uh, channel. The lecture is titled Inksa Corporations as quote unquote Indian tribes under federal Indian law and the constitution, and it's being presented by uh, Chris McNeil. So again, thank you, Adam, uh, for your presentation today, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to make it back up here again soon. So. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely.